that we have found. Here, I got some. Okay. Thanks for your patience, everyone, and thanks for being here. Uh, welcome to the um, Municipal All Candidates meeting for 2022. I can't move too far this way, apparently. <laughs> So this is obviously the first one of these we've done live in some time. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on uh, the traditional territory of the Tlokwit First Nation this evening. And I welcome you to this meeting on behalf of the Volunteer Board of Directors and the staff of the Tofino Long Beach Chamber of Commerce. I'm the Chamber Executive Director, my name is Jen Dart, and with me helping out tonight is one of our board members, Miles Beebe, and then also Kate, uh, Kate O'Connell, who works with us as the, our member services admin assistant. Uh, big thanks to Mark McHugh, who did get the live stream up and running tonight from uh, On the Beach Motion Picture Pictures. And Mike, Mike Jennings is here as well from Tokina Light and Sound, so making sure we're all mic'd, properly mic'd up. Um, the Chamber usually hosts these meetings. Uh, we are, as many of you know, a business organization, and um, we host these meetings so that uh, the community, community can hear directly from those who are seeking to represent them, uh, whether it be at the municipal, provincial, or federal level. Um, and although it seems like a long time ago now, we did host one of these meetings last year for the municipal by-election to elect a mayor and two councillors. This time around, uh, as you know, the incumbent mayor, Dan Law, uh, is, has been acclaimed, so he's actually not allowed to participate in this forum um, per BC elections rules. Um, so tonight we have seven individuals seeking a seat on council. Uh, there are six positions, so which is unfortunate, but fortunate that we get to have a meeting. So thank you all for putting your names forward. Um, some of you have served on council before, uh, some have run before, and some are running for the first time. And I just want to stress that uh, you all have my admiration. It's not an easy job, nor does it pay the big bucks. So uh, community, the community service aspect is really an important part of, of why people do this. Um, thank you for your willingness to run, and also thank you for participating in this forum with us. So a few things to note, this meeting is being recorded for Facebook Live for those who couldn't be here tonight, and will be posted to our Chamber YouTube channel tomorrow. The format is quite simple, we have asked each of the candidates to prepare, prepare an opening and a closing statement, uh, and then we also pre-gave uh, them two questions from the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which they were able to prepare answers for. After that, we're just going to open it up for your questions. Uh, we're obviously giving priority to all of you who came to be with us in the room. Uh, we're also going to be taking questions from our Facebook page and from the event online, so feel free to, to enter them there. Um, during the meeting, just a warning to the audience members that um, the noises can be picked up on the feed, so uh, just keep that in mind. And then I also wanted to let everyone know that advanced voting does start tomorrow at council chambers at the municipal hall and not here at the community hall. So that is tomorrow, October 5th, and then the regular voting day is October 15th. Um, yeah, so I think we're gonna roll right into the uh, introductions from each of uh, the candidates. And we are starting tonight in reverse alphabetical order, so Kat Thomas. Um, and perhaps maybe I'll just go through everyone's name. We have uh, in the front, on the far left, Ali Sawyer, Ali Anderson, John Enns, Sarah Sloman, and then top left, Tom Steer, Kat Thomas, and Duncan McMaster. So, Kat, uh, over to you. Hey, good evening, everybody. Like told me to hold the microphone like a rock star so you guys could all hear me. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and so many faces that I hope become familiar. My name is Kat. I work at the Tofino Distillery, which may not be where you know me from. If you meet me outdoors, you'll see me accompanied by a very large, big black dog, and you're forgiven if he's the one that captivated your attention. My professional background is in the world of food and beverage management, with time spent as various levels of chef, restaurant supervisor, and bar manager. Running a municipality, running a restaurant, vastly different things, I understand, but they have many overlapping skills. 
Both are ultimately about taking care of people. I'm running for council with that in mind. Issues that are at the forefront of this for me are housing, affordability, access to services, and sustainability. My personal background is more colorful. I've lived the life of not knowing where I will live next week, of choosing between gas to travel to work or food on the table. And I know I only stand in the position I do today because of some amazing local landlords who provided secure housing at a rate that I could afford. And I work for a small business that values work-life balance, which includes paying me a living wage. I firmly believe in lifting others up when you can, and while I'm not a landlord or a business owner to offer these for other people, I do feel I can make a positive impact on the lives around me by running for council. I'm looking forward to our discussions this evening, but I'm even more so looking forward to taking the ideas here tonight and actively applying them to continue to make Tofino a place that we can all call home. Thank you. Thanks, Kat, and Tom Steer is next. Great, thank you. Uh, what she said, sorry, no. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tom Steer, and, and I've been um, a resident of Fino for 35 years. I've been married for 21 years as of last week. We had our anniversary. And I have two sons, aged 16 and 19, and, and the oldest one born just down here in the hospital. And um, I'm currently, in terms of my profession, I'm a rescue specialist with the Canadian Coast Guard. I also teach our medical program. And uh, historically, um, came here in 1988 and uh, we created the Tofino Sea Kayaking Company, uh, which is still in business today. And then for 10 years, I worked for the Clockwood Biosphere Project, um, which was a research organization uh, based on local um, research projects, as well as uh, facilitating uh, multiple research projects uh, from around the world. Um, I am, uh, in terms of my experience here on, uh, in Tofino, um, Currently, I am a counselor with the District of Tofino, and I've been a volunteer for, well, I'm a director on the Rain, Rainforest Education Society. I've been a past executive on the Parent Advisory, uh, Parent Advisory Committee. I'm a director on the Harbor Authority. The point of all of that is that I have a, I've had a long involvement with the community, which I think gives me a, a unique perspective and broad understanding of both the historical and current issues facing the residents of Tofino. Because of this experience, I've had the opportunity to build relationships with residents and organizations from all walks of life, and I've shared many of the challenges and opportunities that face them. I've chosen to run again because I feel my experience on the last term of council has made me a better counselor, and I can more efficiently serve the community in tackling the challenges and opportunities moving forward. I firmly believe Tofino is an incredible place to live, raise a family, grow older, and have a high quality of life. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and Sarah Sloman. Hi, I am Sarah Sloman. I was born 46 years ago today at Tofino General. And uh, I, graduated. <laughs> I graduated from UQ at secondary school. I attended college at, in Victoria where I studied horticulture. I then returned back to Tofino and opened a small landscaping business with my business partner, which we have successfully operated for over 20 years. We serve residential, commercial, and strata properties. My husband and I bought our property and built our home in 2003, where we raised our family. I am an avid outdoor enthusiast, so I cherish our forests and our beaches. I feel like my life experiences have given me a deep understanding of where our community has come from and what it needs to succeed. I want to re represent the residents of Tofino and make choices which benefit youth, families, seniors, and our environment. Birthday. Thank you. Um, Ali Sawyer is next. All right. Hi, everyone who may have met me before but not recognized me because when I'm at work, I usually have my hair up and I'm wearing glasses. But you would have seen me in one of the many kitchens here in town. I moved here about 10 years ago. Currently, I am managing Taco Fino. And I have just, I didn't expect to be running again, but I'm running for the same reasons I ran last time, which was people asked me to. And I feel like if there is a reason you're going to do it, you are representing the town. You're representing the needs of many diverse people. And if people believe I'm listening to them, 
and I could represent them, I am pretty honored by that. Thanks. Okay. Good evening. I know most of the people here, and some of you actually like me. <laughs> However, for those that don't know me, I'm Duncan McMaster. I was born and raised in Manchester, England, on the council estate, which is now known as affordable housing in Canada. I graduated in geophysics at Liverpool University and spent the majority of my career traveling the world doing geophysical operations. I emigrated to Canada in 1980 and my wife and I moved to Tofino in 2006 where we owned and operated a bed and breakfast for 12 years. I was elected to council in 2011. I've served on the audit committee, the Vancouver Island Regional Library Board and the Tofino Housing Corporation. A local volunteer work includes the Legion and Lowe's and Fishes. Why am I running again? It's because I care about the community and I'm worried about the problems we face, such as affordability, housing, water supply, and the lack of amenities that other communities take for granted, especially in recreation. My work overseas has taught me that Canada is the best country in the world, and I believe that Tofino is the best place in Canada to live, and I want to keep it that way. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. John Enns. Hello, I'm John Enns, and I'm uh, honoured to be here. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, all the local people for creating this community. We came here uh, 25 years ago and uh, just loved the place and loved the people especially. And uh, I've been active in the housing scene most of that time. I work at the Co-op Hardware part-time and I run the Lowe's and Fishes Food Bank and also run the Tofino Rental Sites on Facebook. I served on various boards and Tofino District Housing Committees. I have a master's in intercultural ministries and I've traveled to many countries. And I've seen how local people uh, can live happily in tourist towns and I've also seen how they can't live there at all. And uh, this has always been my concern. I, I also, uh, it's the most important thing about me is I try to follow Jesus. He's given me a new life and a uh, love for other people. I've also been a renter and I've been a landlord and I've been that for both vacation rentals and long-term rentals in Tofino. But I've watched Tofino change and good people having to move away. And I want to help the locals have a secure and happy, um, balanced community. I feel we can have a better tourist experience and a better and more secure home for local workers if we balance these in a responsible way. We need to protect and increase the housing for locals. There's been too much consumed by tourism. Uh, we need to stop cutting down the old growth and building tourist residences that we don't have enough water for anyway. Local workers who live in, in their own safe and healthy RV or van or tiny home uh, need to not be afraid of by law to evict them. We need a, 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 healthy, a healthy and happy and safe place for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, John. And finally, Arla Anderson. Hello everyone. For those of that, that don't know me, I'm Al Anderson. I'm a small business owner operating two businesses in Tofino. Most of my community work has been as counselor, but I do lend my support to volunteer efforts and contribute where I can. It may surprise some of you to know that I'm not a property owner. I've served on council for over 20 years, one term as mayor. I've also served at the ACRD, the Library Board, and the Central Region Board as a provincial appointee. I've been a resident of Tofino for about 40 years and have a great love for this place and its community, the place I love to call home. I'm seeking re-election this term to bring my knowledge of local government and my experience to serve on council um, and to serve our community. I believe in an open and collaborative approach to decision making and I am a strong advocate for community engagement, especially on land use issues. In the past term, the past term of council has been marked by Zoom meetings and by two by-elections. Despite this, under council's guidance, 
the effort and the efforts of staff, the District of Tofino has made good progress with our liquid waste management plan underway and significant gains in housing. I wish to see the continuation of Council's support for housing initiatives through the THC to access and leverage current funding from higher levels of government and through our planning department in securing the best outcomes from the private sector. I'm a strong supporter and advocate for the arts, culture and heritage initiatives and currently enjoy chairing the EACH committee. That's the Events Arts Culture Heritage Committee, if you don't know the acronym. Tofino has benefited greatly. Sorry, oh. So we are keeping over to two minutes. Sorry about that. Uh, but just to keep things flowing here. Um, and the chamber, as I mentioned, gave the candidates two questions. And Miles is going to read the first of those questions. We're going to pull the first respondent out of this box here. Okay, candidates. As you know, the District of Tofino has, through the Tofino Housing Corporation, started building attainable housing for residents. We know the current housing shortage is affecting the ability of the residents and families to remain in town, as well as many of the business operators. Our question is twofold. Do you support the Tofino Housing Corporation's continued work on attainable housing and the DOT has previously identified DL114 as the most suitable location for attainable housing development. Do you support its continued development in this location? Please share any other thoughts on housing. This uh, question is for Sarah Slogan. Okay, I have to go very fast. I did a lot of research. I do think the THC is a well-intended organization which has done a tremendous amount of work to make our housing secure for residents in Tofino. So I do support their continued work. When it comes to future development of District Lot 114, it is important to know I grew up on Duffin Cove in the Tonka neighborhood. This area to me is sacred. Because of my deep connection, I felt it was important to call residents in the area and around town, and also some of my housing insecure friends, so I could have a broad scope of how residents really felt. The concerns were, the current phase is too expensive, the trailer park would better suit their needs, the THC was not required to follow the same rules as regular developers regarding sidewalks and underground services, it will destroy a wildlife corridor, the clear cutting will dry and threaten a nearby red-legged tree frog habitat, we won't have enough hospital beds. We don't have recreation or care facilities for seniors or youth that can adequately serve our current population. There has been a lack of respect to existing neighborhoods. There's unsignaled blasting, long hours, no sidewalks, some significant damage to their homes, and they will get a permanently noisier neighborhood. The increased traffic to the town or to the area will affect all intersections in town, further adding to congestion and frustration. The clear cutting will directly contribute to global warming and destroy an old growth forest. A large amount of our population enjoy the trails located in District Lot 114, and this would be a huge loss to them, further limiting recreation options. If we increase our population by 2%, we could be out of water by 2030. We will continue to have private development, so any future development of District Lot 114 will make this happen sooner. So at this time, it would be negligent of me to support future development of District Lot 114 for any housing and encourage the THC to find another site or plan. I'm excited to see the current phase completed and occupied. Oops, exactly two minutes. Um, and John and Sierra next. <clears throat> for the same question, at, at any time you need it repeated, just let us know. Um. Okay, as far as uh, the L114 goes, <clears throat> I understood that the reason that the that was chosen was because it was the only one that was uh, zoned for such. Um, but at the same time, like I have to agree with Sarah that it is probably not the, the best uh, place to, to put things like that. And uh, there are other places, like they're going to be putting in a sewer treatment plants. That means they're going to extend services. Uh, into an area that we haven't had before, and there's going to be lots of uh, place there for uh, development if, if they can do that instead. 
Uh, the DL114 is a beautiful old growth forest, and, and I, I love walking through there too, and so it's, that's kind of sad. But far as the, the question, do I support their work on attainable housing, I do support the intent and goals. Uh, but I also feel that it takes a lot of time and a lot of money the way that it's been doing. And uh, if we could get some uh, private developer with uh, a covenant so that it would be not um, just a money-making project, I think that it would work uh, better, probably faster, and probably cheaper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next response will come from Tom Steer, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I do support the continued work of attainable housing by the Tofino Housing Corporation. It is a critical component of addressing the housing supply in Tofino, and specifically the targeted types of housing as identified in the housing needs assessment. Council passed a resolution on September 27th in support of uh, looking at options for attainable housing development on district and private lands, and for opportunities for the community engagement on those options that are identified with consultation and prioritization. To the second part of the question, the DOT, the District of Tofino, has definitely previously identified DL114 as a suitable location, and they have acted on it. There will be 72 units of attainable housing rental and duplexes will be available by 2024, as I'm sure many of you are aware of by the construction going on. So DL114 is being developed. A new neighborhood is being created for residents of the community. At this time, I'm looking forward to the potential options for attainable housing being brought forward by the THC and feel that the DL114 has fulfilled its mandate at this time and don't see the need at this particular time for further development of this particular piece of property. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, our next response will come from Kat Thomas. I do support the Tofino Housing Corporation's work on attainable housing. I support actions that are going to see Tofino residents with safe, affordable roofs over their heads. I trust that all due diligence has been done to decide on the district lot 114 as the location for the current Headwaters project. For affordable housing, I believe that accessibility to basic amenities is also a key factor for deciding location. This being walking distance to the grocery store, post office, and medical clinic is ideal because it alleviates some transportation costs for residents. Walkability also reduces traffic, which is ideal for everyone. I'd like to see housing issues continue to be worked on by improving higher density housing, something I personally benefit from living in a UWIC condo, as well as managing vacation rentals. I would propose that new short-term rental licenses only go to people who are operating from their primary residence, removing the option to be an absentee owner. Thank you, Kat. Um, next response will come from Ali Sawyer, please. All right, so as a renter living in a house that went up for sale, I feel this issue very keenly. Something I think to realize is DL114, or Tonquin, as I'm gonna call it, as most of us know it, is that project has been mostly approved. That project, the land is cleared. It is underway. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, something that I realized looking at that project that I would like us to be conscious of with future housing needs either projects that are being looked at by the district or privately are how can we put more people in a position oh, sorry i haven't been around this many people in a really long time <laughs> um so basically the duplexes are unaffordable for most people that need them unless they are two very high income earning people with an inheritance. So, if we are doing future projects, we need to look at how much people are making. So, a couple, maybe with a child, where do they probably work? What kind of mortgage would they qualify for? And then build appropriate buildings for that part of our population. So as far as housing needs go, no, I do not uh, support further development in Tonquin, and that is what I would be focusing on. 
Thank you, Ali. Uh, the next respondent will be Al Anderson. Uh, <clears throat> to the first question, um, it was during my term of, as mayor that I, I began the Tofino Housing Corporation with the support of council. It was one of the things that uh, was, was key in my campaigning at that time, and I was really glad to see that we got the support of the community and council to get that going. At that time, there wasn't um, really much in the way of, of higher levels of government funding government funding affordable housing, and the uh, Tofino Housing Corporation wasn't capable of of really getting some projects off the ground. So it, it was kind of uh, hibernating for a while, and recently um, we were successful in getting some grants through the Housing Corporation in partnership with BC, the federal government, um, CMHC. And so it takes several partners to come together and, and get these kind of projects off the ground. So it's critical that that body stays in place and continues to do the kind of work that it takes to pull all that funding and partnerships together. And I do support its continuation. Um, it's, its work right now is more important than ever because currently and only, only recently the federal and provincial governments have come forward recognizing the housing crisis in Canada, BC, and that we're all feeling everywhere, and uh, finally come to the table after decades of not funding housing. So the work that's getting done right now is, is largely because those, those gates have been opened a little bit. Um, and in terms of further development of, of District 1114, it's been, it's been identified in three different iterations of the official community plan as future housing for Tofino. And that, to me, is the voice of the community. Sorry, Sorry. your time is up. And uh, so I think that's worth continuing exploring. Thank you, Al. Sorry about the cut to cut you off there. Um, and we will now pass the mic to Duncan McMaster. Uh, well, I'm chair of the Tofino Housing Corporation, so obviously I do support the work of the Tofino Housing Corporation, and also support the work of anybody that tries to provide attainable and affordable housing, private or THC. By the fall of 2023, headquarters or DL14, there'll be 70 units which can be added to the 14 units at Creekside. I went to the Creekside opening and when I listened to stories from one lady who said she'd moved 10 times in 11 years, that shows that we need housing. And you can't open a paper or watch the news without hearing about the housing problem in Canada. And I don't think there's been any rental housing built in Tofino since Sin City was built, which was way before my time being here. You, we can't do this without having land. The, the only way we're going to get money from the federal and provincial government is to offer land up. We got $10 million from the federal and provincial governments. And that got us started on deal on the floor. Is it the most suitable location? Maybe not, but you've got to do what you dealt with. That's what we were presented with. We were dealt with DL114, and that allowed us to get $10 million. Even if every possible building site on DL114 was built on, which it's not, only 25% of DL114 would be built on. There's so much difficult terrain and watersheds. I'll summarise this and say the solution to affordable housing is to build affordable housing. Building expensive housing increases the supply of expensive housing, which increases competition between buyers and renters. Seeking less expensive housing, this action leads to increases in rents and the cost of housing. So let's keep on building more affordable housing. If we've got to find more land, we're I'm happy to move from D114 to somewhere else. We've just got to identify why that land is. Thanks, Duncan. Can I want to make a rebuttal, please? To so we're not out. starting rebuttals to the, no, to the audience question, sorry. Okay, that's no problem. Um, so question number two from the Chamber. In a recent survey conducted by the Chamber of Commerce, community amenities were listed as the second largest consideration for respondents after housing. 
What community amenities, recreation or other, would you support during your term on council? And we're gonna to go to Tom Steer first for this one. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to thank the chamber for including this question. Um, it's very kind of you. Um, I've been long supporting, I've long supported increased recreational opportunities for residents and our neighbors. That is included in indoor recreation facility, as well as improvements to the Village Green, skate park, tennis court, and basketball courts. I'd like to see an expansion of our outdoor trails, and I'm not sure if I would define it as an amenity, uh, but a necessity, but the continued lobbying uh, for a, a healthcare facility for our region, what has been described as, as a campus of care, which is included in that campus of care. What I would like to see is more long-term capabilities, long-term care capabilities, and assisted living for seniors to be able to return and stay in this community. I would also support looking at increased educational opportunities. Tofino working with SD70 and, trust, and our new trustee and the Ministry of Education. We're the only community in British Columbia of our size that does not have a high school. I could even see options for a middle school possibility in our community. Once again, I don't know if this is an, an amenity, but a necessity. I do believe that there are a whole list of other amenities that this community could be looking forward to. Once again, it just comes down to how we would pay for it. But those that we've seen um, uh, come forward uh, recently, such as uh, contributions to the Village Green through the playground. That was through private contribution as well as the work that was done by the District of Tofino. So there are, there is a long bucket list of wonderful things that this community could have and would enjoy. Um, and I would continue to support um, uh, those that uh, might be brought forward by other candidates. Thanks, Tom and Kat, you're next for this one. My answer for this one's a little more bullet pointy and not as much of a paragraph. Um, I think first, um, public transportation is the biggest one that comes to mind. I know we're on the cusp of beginning our West Coast Transit service and really feel this is gonna be a huge benefit for many people. Obviously, when we drive from Yuki back to here, we definitely see people hitchhiking. We know people need to get to health services that are only provided in our town. Um, workers just getting around in the rain. Absolutely, I'm really looking forward to that and then how we'll shape that in the future. Um, some of the things that fall outside of our municipal scope but are worth mentioning because I would love to offer support in any way I can, a new hospital and improved library services. The big one on everyone's mind, of course, is a recreational facility, which includes a pool. I know we can only act on that one once we have a concrete water supply plan. A very personal one to me would be an off-leash dog park. Um, obviously, that would require a lot of public engagement because there's never been a, a decided moment for that, but it would definitely alleviate some of the some of the problems that we encounter on the beach with dogs running and shorebirds and things like that. Um, compost is one that I hear quite often, and I like the bus system, I know that this is on the way. I also know from living in other communities across the country that during implementation, there can be a very steep learning curve. Um, so I'm looking forward to all of the education and navigating the challenges that are going to come with getting us all on board with the whole new system. On the topic of waste management, this is a very minor one, um, but I would love to see more trash cans, more refuse cans across the map. Um, not having one between 4th Street and Beaches, obviously Industrial Way has lots of foot traffic and I pick up trash there on a pretty regular basis. Um, that's all. Thanks, Kat. Al Anderson is next for this one. Um, I, I, I'd like to be very focused in the next term on just, uh, just two <laughs> uh, facilities. I'd like to see a recreation hall facility um, of some sort developed, and we've been working on in terms of designing and uh, lobbying for, for a grant to build a recreation facility next to the community hall here. I hope to see that come forward. Um, I would love to see the multi the um, multiplex arena and swimming pool go forward. I'm just wondering if if it, they're a little bit more than the communities can support on the west coast right now in terms of operating costs. Those are big projects and uh, we may have to grow into them. Um, and finally, the, um, just to sort of to comment on those things, not, my full support is not behind that at this point. 
Um, we've been waiting about 25 years with temporary library facilities, and I really think we deserve to have a proper library building, and that's the other facility I'd like to really focus on for us. We pay into the Vancouver Island Regional Library, and part of that is a facility replacement plan that's been in place for a long time, and I don't think we're moving fast enough on that. And we've, we've had a few, including myself, representatives, uh, trustees at the board table, working towards that goal, and I hope to see it happen in this term. So I think by being focused, we can make some headway on those projects. Thanks all. Uh, next is Duncan. Well, we all know that Tofino lacks indoor recreation facilities, especially in the wet winter months. I support both the concept of a Tofino recreation centre and the multiplex. Um, but yet neither project will go ahead without federal or provincial funding and the competition for those grants is really tough. If you put push came to shove, I would prefer a facility in Tofino because having been involved in the fitness industry for a while, I know that people use a facility that's on the back doorstep rather than having to catch a bus or travel down the road for 20 minutes. A positive from the liquid waste management plant is that it will be a source of heat. So I think we should explore opportunities to use this heat for maybe a pool, if we can afford it. It could be an outdoor pool, or if we get a rec centre, it could heat the, the rec centre. As I mentioned before, competition for grants is great. And I think at times we need to think outside the box. I talked to some friends of mine in uh, Calgary that uh, built a dome over three tennis courts. This was uh, three years ago, and it cost them $200,000. $200,000, let's say it's $500,000 now. That's within the realm of possibility for this town if we use parking funds and things like that. So, Let's not just hope and pray that we get grants. Let's start to think of alternatives and move ahead and try and do something. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, we will pass the mic to John Hens. All right. Well, there's, there's some really good ideas there. and I don't have uh, the information that Duncan has. I really appreciate people who can uh, do that kind of work. Um, for myself, I've uh, thought and I've talked to other people in town uh, definitely, I, I think I would love to see something better with the transportation. And people are saying, like, well, why don't we have the electric bus going year-round? You know, like, it's be great for us. The locals actually need it more during the winter because it's raining and difficult to get around. Um, I would like to see that. And I'd also, thinking about the pool, people say, look, you know, we're, we're living in a town that's surrounded by water. People are going to school on water. Our kids need to learn how to swim, but you know, you, you don't want to swim in the ocean here. So what is going to happen is we're, we're going to need to have a pool, I think, sooner or later. How are we going to get the water in and that for that? Well, my favorite thing actually about all of these is that we should collect green water. Uh, if you imagine there's a roof of this building, 10 feet high, stuck with water. That's how much water we get every year. And this is only one roof. There's lots of roofs that we can uh, tap into that way. So, you know, part of, part of that is maybe not uh, uh, amenity, uh, that we're getting into necessities here, but I think it's important. And, uh, and I think a lot of these things tie together. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, the next responder will be Ali Sawyer. All right, so as many of the other candidates brought up, amenities can mean different things to different people, whether it's having a softball league for your kids or yourself to play in, whether it's choir, whether it's being able to go see live music. And I feel like we are doing a lot with what we have. I think that without taking away from other needs in town, something we can focus on is going back to if we create housing that is affordable for purchase for more people, we are increasing our tax base. And so then we'll have more money to work with 
to create more amenities for the people that are actually able to stay in this town. Thank you very much. Um, and we will now pass the mic to Sarah. Thank you. I think I'm going to repeat a lot of what everyone else said, but um, again, I canvassed the community to see what amenities we need and are important to livability here. Overwhelmingly, recreation was brought up. We seem to have an unstable relationship with School District 70, and the use of the gym in the field is not sec a secure option. We are currently facing the loss of the baseball field due to child the child care facility, which is needed. And our baseball community is vibrant and healthy. I want to support them find a secure field with two baseball diamonds. I would like to have a soccer field in the, and a track. I think recreation facilities are very important because they can greatly benefit our mental health. Through games, we can have greater connections with our neighboring communities. I would support a swimming pool if it is financially viable as youth, adults, seniors, and people with injury can benefit. A child living here, as John said, no longer has the ability to learn how to swim, but they are continually on and around the water. I would like to have a reliable gym space, and I would support uh, care facilities for seniors and rehabilitation. I definitely heard with our, in our community that there is a great concern about cost and affordability, so I will definitely look, take this into consideration when I make decisions. I would like to see the return of community-oriented events, like the old-fashioned Clackwood days we used to have. I would like to support kids' bike parades and even races. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to thoughtfully answer those two submitted questions. Uh, we're now going to open questions to the floor. There's a microphone at the far end if you wish to ask it in person. There's also a box that you can write your question down at the back of this on this red table. Um, if you don't want to ask it in person. Um, if you are asking a question, please just specify who you would like to get asked to. If you don't specify, we're going to probably draw about half of the candidates but at random to answers in the interest of time and trying to get to as many questions as possible. We also have some submitted questions that we can ask if, if we don't have anyone from the floor that has a, a very important burning question for the candidates today. Anyone want to start us off? Kathy, sure. Eileen? Oh, can you speak close to the microphone, Mike says. Hi, uh, my name is Eileen Fluddy. Is that on? Yeah. Hi, my name is Eileen Fluddy. Um, I live on First Street here in Tofino. We uh, have lived here since uh, 2006, but we've been familiar with the community since 1991. Um, my f real question is, uh, the whole thing about housing is, seems to be, um, housing seems to be been taken away by vacation rentals uh, out of uh, community owners and also by resorts purchasing properties and um, using them as staff housing. That uh, certainly has a, an impact on the availability of affordable housing or even, unaffor or even regular housing. And I'm just wondering what kinds of um, instruments might you think of looking at to use to combat that? Give all of the, okay, if all of the staff housing in Ocean Park were owned by individual families, I think there would be a definite easing of uh, housing availability. Thank you. Anyone in particular you want to have that question answered by? Um, uh, no, just draw it out of a hat. Okay, Kat, you're going to be first. I think with issue of staff housing, we can't really fault businesses for buying houses to put their staff in, um, given that where else are they going to put the staff? If they have property that they could build on, say when resorts are expanding, like when Hotel Z was adding additional rooms, additional staff, being required to put in additional staff housing makes sense. Um, unfortunately, that one's a little more sticky than just telling businesses that they can't have a house to put their staff in when that is one of the greatest tools a business has for bringing staff in and retaining their staff. With vacation rentals, we all know that the people that already have their licenses will be grandfathered into whatever we do, so we need to look at what we do with licenses going forward. I strongly believe that we don't go as extreme as, extreme as Euclid has just done with their rules. But I think it would benefit us if we just give licenses to people who are using their primary residences 
So if people have a house and they have a caretaker suite that they wish to Airbnb out, maybe that's a little bit different than renting out their five bedroom house. I think that would alleviate a lot of it while giving locals the opportunity to utilize their, their property to pay their mortgages. Okay, thanks. And next we're gonna hear from Al. Um, yeah, I think that it's important that um, council and, and the district work to protect housing for residents in Tofino. Um, the, the, the zonings, the, the use of, of short-term rentals in, in most residential zonings was kind of a, a blanket decision and maybe a little bit short-sighted. Um, it hasn't really worked out as well as we had thought a long time ago uh, that every short-term rental, like a B&B, would have uh, a resident or an owner all living there and operating it. So as we've seen short-term rentals grow, it's become a problem with enforcement to make sure that that's happened. Otherwise, for every short-term rental, there would be a, a long-term resident of some sort, either a renter or an owner. Um, so I think going forward, we really have to be careful about new zones that we create to make sure that the short-term rental use isn't allowed in it. So we're looking at uh, uh, comprehensive development zones and, and new zoning designations that, that exclude that use. Um, we, I think we have to be really careful in sort of dealing with the whole short-term rental issue because it's one of the enablers that make it for young, young families and people starting out to be able to afford to get a home here at all, um, having that extra income from it. Um, so zoning is, is really the primary tool that we can use to protect and, and develop new types of housing. Density is the kind of thing that will make it less uh, expensive and um, also use less land as we go forward. Okay. Thanks, Al. And Ali. So housing in this town is limited and it is a resource and like any other resource, there are many ways to manage it. Uh, whichever route we choose, I think as many other times in the past with resources, you go a little too hard on it, you lose, you realize it's slipping away and then you have to focus and make a plan. We can't shut things down completely we can be smart about new buildings and what we choose to allow there. We can definitely encourage people, and I do think most community members want to use housing to the best of their abilities, whether it is just like a suite that allows them to have small income. But I think most of the people that live here aren't the ones living in those suites in the basement while renting out their house upstairs. Some people do, for sure but not most of them. As far as the staff of homes go, there used to be so many houses up Lone Cone and on Pfeiffer that weren't necessarily staff of homes, but they were definitely rented out by a lot of different people. And that has just transformed in a way, whereas now that was a landlord renting to, you know, five young people new to town. Now that landlord is just a business, but it's still the same house, it's still the same vibe. And honestly, I think I would rather see people living in a staff home that are staying in this town and working in our businesses than maybe necessarily an Airbnb. Thanks. Thanks, Sally. And finally on this question, we'll have John. Thank you. Um, yeah, housing has been on my heart for a long time. Um, and uh, thank you, Ellie, for bringing up the differentiation between the staff housing and, uh, and vacation rentals. It's, a, it's an important thing. Uh, we have a need for workers in this town to have a safe and clean and, and a healthy environment to live in. And uh, on, on my Facebook page, I get workers who are living in staff uh, asking me, please, do you have a trailer? Do you have anything? Do you sleep in the basement? You know, whatever. Uh, because some staff accounts are really crowded and some are not safe. Um, it's important to me that uh, the people that are working here, whether they're working just for the summer or whether they're working long term, uh, that they have a safe and healthy place. And, and that's uh, 
something that I, I've been working on for a while. But um, one of the uh, tools that we mentioned, there are many tools to handle this, is, is uh, that we can have a, a cap on the amount of tourist beds. And I, I recognize that it's a, it's a big difference between somebody who owns a home and lives there or somebody from out of town who comes, buys a house, and kicks everybody out, all the residents uh, might have lived there for a long time, uh, then turns it into a little mini hotel. And that has happened. I've been in places like that. And uh, that has happened here. And we've and we got to be able to be on top of that. Or, or a caretaker that is actually a caretaker for four different places. Uh, owners of okay, that live, <laughs> that live in, 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 theoretically live in, in, a, in a room that's actually a room closet. So we, we need to get on top of this stuff because we are losing our residents. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, and I mentioned to the candidates earlier, any audience questions that any of the candidates want to make a rebuttal to, they're entitled to do that, a one minute um, rebuttal. So that option is open by raising your hand. Um, we're gonna move on to the next question from the floor. I believe Kathy wanted to ask a question. Hi, I'm Kathy Fick, and my question is, pertains to recreation in our community. And I noticed in the Tofino Ratepayers Association when I read through what the candidates were speaking about, that five of seven of you spoke to the need for more recreation in the district of Tofino. Two out of seven of you made no comment on recreation in terms of the when asked about what your priorities were, I'm, I'm particularly interested in your priorities because you will be the decision makers on those priorities. And tonight I only heard four out of seven of you made that your priority. So somebody is flip-flopping on this according to what I've read. So I'm just wondering, you know, I'd like some clarity on where you stand on this and I'm also interested to know exactly what recreation facility you would endorse for the town of Topino? We've been struggling for this for 40 years, I think. And in the time that I've been here, I have seen um, nothing but a loss. We've had a loss of swimming pool. We've had a loss of an ice rink since the 70s. We've had, now we're facing a loss of our fields. So which facility are you interested in promoting? And more importantly, what might you propose to the District of Tofino and to the voters as a funding stream for this? Because it's, it's really great to talk about what's, what, what we need, but we need to figure out how we're going to fund it. So those are my questions. Thanks, Kathy. Was there anyone in particular you wanted to have answer that? No, you made John out of that. Thanks. Thanks. So which facilities for recreation are your priority, and how would you fund them? Um, Duncan. Well, I almost feel as if I've just spoken about this, but uh, I spoke recreation because I know a lot of people, aside from the cost of living here, do leave town because there are no recreation facilities for the kids. I mean, it's silly that a kid can't learn to swim. Um, I keep on getting told that a pool isn't feasible in Tofino and that it's too expensive. But I think that was before we had a source of heat from the liquid waste management plant. So I really think we need to explore that option, and maybe it's an outdoor pool that's just used in the in the summer months. I mentioned about looking at the possibility of building bubbles over f facilities like the tennis courts. Um, tennis courts are used actively by the pickleball group and not so actively by the tennis group. And I think it would be a lot better if those guys could still play outside in the winter rather than just coming down to one court in this facility here. I support both the Multiplex and the Tofino Recreation Centre that's proposed. Um, as I said, if it, my choice would be to have a facility in town because I think it'll be used by the locals more because I was brought up where you got on your bike and you rode to the Recreation Centre and your mother knew where to find you. Children aren't going to ride down the highway to the Multiplex. I mean, it could be a great facility, but we'll see. So whichever one gets a grant, any facility is better than no facility. Aside from sport and fitness, the other facilities I'd like to see, I'd like to see the community theatre, 
upgraded and just like Councillor Anderson, I'm on the library board as well and I want to see a new library with a study area for kids and I think that could be a great vehicle for kids getting together from First Nations and Tofino doing the homework together and I think that'll work really well. Great, thanks Duncan. Sarah. Well, I think I pretty much said it before, but um, I'll say it again. I think our priority should be with the baseball soccer field because we're gonna be losing that, from what I understand, that's under threat right now. And so I don't wanna lose that because from my understanding is we kind of have a working relationship with the gym so we can kind of work with that, but that is still a really big priority for me. I'd like to have that a secure facility for that. And I really, I really felt the community told me that we really need a pool, and affordability is a big issue. But I think eventually we're going to have to do this, and so those are my priorities. Okay, thanks, and Tom, last for this one. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, there's no question I've been a long supporter of uh, recreation uh, in this community. I served on the Rec Commission for 10 years uh, and was Vice Chair for many years. I'm a Little League, was a Little League coach, and we haven't had it for a while. Um, I'm highly supportive of, of many of the aspects that have been spoken about here. Um, uh, the indoor recreation facility, I've been a long supporter, and that was initiated uh, initially because of our lack of access to the indoor facility that we had at Wigan Inish Community School. Those conversations with SD70 went over a long period of time. Uh, in the interim, we are redeveloping that conversation uh, with SD70 and looking at what those opportunities might be there. There has been some um, questioning about the, the loss of those soccer field and uh, baseball diamonds. I know um, with the daycare center going onto that property, um, uh, my understanding is there's a reconfiguration and that there will be um, uh, much less uh, uh, there, the opportunity to retain those fields uh, is, is in the works. Um, it's not for sure, but it's certainly in the works. It's been recognized that it's a, an important community asset and SD70 recognizes that as well. Keeping in mind that is SD70 property. Um, the other, um, so I am supportive of an indoor recreation facility. The, and one of the part of that question um, from uh, Kathy was, what are some maybe outside of the box funding mechanisms? We know that we've um, required um, our last facility failed because we did not have access to the 73% granting through Northern Infrastructure um, granting. Um, it is still a possibility. It is true that the granting infrastructure in British Columbia right now is at, a, is at a fairly low process. So thinking outside the box for those types of capital fundings that will be necessary for that type of facility is necessary. There are some ways of thinking outside the box that Councillor uh, uh, Duncan has spoken to, and I think those should definitely be explored. Uh, in the upcoming uh, time frame. That's great, thanks. So again, I'm gonna give the opportunity to anyone who did not answer that question to have a quick weigh in if you'd like. Uh, and if not, I think we're going to take a very short break and we're talking under five minutes. So um, it'll give you a chance to stretch your legs, write your question down for the box in the back if you'd like to. And online for those viewers watching on Facebook Live, you can share a question to our Facebook page or email info at tofinochamber.org. So about five minutes. And at this time, we'll ask the candidates to uh, do a little seat shuffle.
bylaw and during all the decisions you're going to be making when you're on council will you ever be thinking about climate change as you make them I would like to run this question by Sarah Tom and Allie if that's possible. great so first Sarah well would I support a would what was your word? A tree bylaw? Tree protection? Um, I think I possibly could. I think I remember something in the history about when this was 
maybe brought up before and there was like a clear cut happened. So I'd be pretty tentative about putting my support behind that. Um, I, I, I do really feel like I, any building or facility that is built, I, I would like to see um, green um, building structures be, or whatever the wording is for that, be brought into use. Like I would like to see um, rain catchment systems. I know from landscaping and doing developing developments, uh, you know, we get all these new facilities and they have landscapes and you can't water them and then we get a permit. And I just feel like this always perpetuates our water shortages. And so I, I think that the infrastructure's out there and we know how to do this. I think that things can be done a lot more green. And I, I would definitely support all that. Um, yes, I talk about those things and I know that, yes, that goes against my beliefs about clear cutting. And I hope we wouldn't have to do that. I don't know where these facilities will go. But I feel like for myself, I could live with this decision if I had to cut some trees down because I feel like it would benefit our whole population. I feel like it would, the seniors could maybe have a nice life here and our children would be able to recreate and play and have games and sports. So I feel like this may be the one situation where I waffle on my tree saving. Thanks, Sarah. And then Tom next, please. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, certainly uh, this council's already initiated a significant tree bylaw as well as um, looking at, uh, in the future, a more comprehensive strategy around that. The other area that I think is important and that uh, we council has talked to and in the budget process moving forward, um, the, the asset management plans that we're looking at, we, we only look at those assets that are tangible, such as the physical structures that we're looking at. We're now looking at um, incorporating what's the natural asset capacity. So looking at the forests and looking at all the commodities that are uh, associated with that, how they provide the services, and, and they do it for free. And we don't give a quantitative value to that. So in understanding that in terms of how we manage our assets, so it may be saying that something, for example, Tonquin Forest has far more value and climate change capacity as well as clean water, clean air, than it does for, say, affordable housing initiatives. So those are the types of things in a, nat in a natural asset management plan that I think the district, well, have, I've been assured we will be looking at in the next budget cycle. Um, in terms of looking at uh, further development sites um, for the types of facilities, I think uh, almost unanimously we would like to look at sites, brown sites, sites that have already been, so for example, the, the proposed new library site is already on a cleared site in Tofino. We would like to look at all of those uh, potentials where we don't have to be, it, it costs money to do that, so if we already have sites that are fully ready to be developed. In fact, uh, it's a win-win situation. We protect trees and we also uh, have cheaper costs for building those facilities. Thanks, Tom. Ali? All right, I'd have to agree with Tom on that. If we do have new development in town for recreation facilities, other things, I do think it's wisest to look at land that has already been cleared or land that has already been cleared and grown back. Old growth trees provide a very specific ecosystem to plants, to animals, to birds and insects that do not thrive in recently cleared or regrown areas. And I don't think any of us moved here because we wanted to live in a wall-to-wall -wall city with only concrete. I think we're all pretty happy having trees next to our windows and hearing birds. Maybe not bears, but they do live here too. <laughs> and I think that as a community, if we increase awareness and education about the benefits of building and maintaining a healthy balance with the environment within our building, they, we will see those decisions being made by people and not being have, uh, having to be enforced by bylaws. Okay, a uh, chance for rebuttal if anyone has one. And Jack Gilly, you're up next for a question from the audience. Can everyone hear me? No? Hello? Uh, in the last year, uh, the district uh, 
modified, shall I say, its arrangement with tourism casino in regard to the MRDT, which is money collected by the uh, main tourist operators. You would normally use for tourist promotion, but you, that was modified. And I, if I could uh, just summarize the deal very crudely, as uh, Tofino got, uh, I think, about $400,000, which was going to be used to allay the, the uh, interest cost on monies borrowed by Tofino for the sewage treatment plant. Um, it, during that meeting in which that agreement was reached between various parties in the community, I put forward the idea that, do we want to be here again four years from now? Because that MRDT has a, a, a term to it. And no one wanted to be there four years from now negotiating the same thing over again, not surprisingly. And I said, why don't we look at a 1% tax across the board on all tourist-related uh, economic activity? Um, and utilize it to do the sorts of things that you've all talked about wanting to do but don't have the money to do. With one of the main ones being uh, the recreational facility. It could also be used for infrastructure. So um, recently uh, a number of councillors have suggested they would prefer to use or they think it would be more successful to try to use the MRDT as a vehicle for achieving those monies rather than going to the province for a unique sales tax for Tofino. Um, and I'm wondering if that idea has support from any of you people right now. Jack, do you have anybody? Should we get everyone to answer that one? Uh, uh, hopefully they can all answer that one. Yeah, right? for sure. All right, we'll just start at the top of John. Thank you, Jack. Um, that, that sounds great. That sounds uh, wonderful if, if we could actually uh, pull that off. And, uh, and I'm not being too skeptical on that one either. It, I, I really seriously would love to see that happen. Um, I also think that uh, in other towns, what they have is a voluntary uh, kind of a tax where the resorts and the restaurants, they have a little uh, uh, local uh, gratuity, uh, to, uh, a little percentage of each bill, and that goes to infrastructure for the town or whatever. And uh, if the tourist doesn't want to pay it, they can uh, contest it and say, no, I, I don't want to pay that. Uh, but it is a voluntary thing, and I think it's easier to do. You don't have to go through any legal stuff to do that. But uh, I would say, like, go for the money wherever you can get it. You know, really, if you can, if you can actually do a 10%, uh, like a 1% on MRDT, that would be great. Okay, thanks, Al. Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, we're all, we've always sort of been looking at more flexible ways of, of trying to use MRDT money. It certainly supported uh, a, a lot more upgrades to the multiple use path and some some trail work and and things that that were at the beginning of the MRD program were a little bit of a stretch to try and get support for uh, any infrastructure we built had to be directly related to increasing tourism and, 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 and making better the tourism experience and wherever it was spent. And, and that includes all resort municipalities. More recently, I think uh, other resort municipalities are also facing the same kind of tax pressures from their communities. and, and um, there may be some room in working with other resort communi communities to try and convince uh, uh, the province, basically, to be more flexible on the use of MRDT money. And it's currently not able to be used for operating costs or for um, any, any sort of typical infrastructure like water, sewer, roads, etc. If you're increasing parking or building uh, a bike lane or something like that. It can be added to a project. So there, there's a bit of leeway and, and flexibility already. Uh, I think if, if we can sort of work with other resort municipalities and get that kind of uh, support, it would, it would probably work better than 
to you know, trying to do things on their own. On one percent tax, I, I think that's still worth exploring. It, it has support from uh, tribal park allies as well, I believe, and there, there's some uh, there's some good things that could come out of that. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah? Um, I would say my concern with the one percent tax it would be um, we have some seniors living here who are on fixed incomes, and that would just further their cost of living. So I have concerns about that, supporting that. Um, I, I would support, I support getting as much money as we can out of the tourists, wherever we feasibly can. So, I mean, if that means we have to go down that route, I don't, I, w I would rather look at getting the resort municipality tax to be used more efficiently. Thanks, Sally. As far as the 1% add-on goes, I would need to know a bit more about how it would be applied and how we would apply it across many different types of businesses that are used by both tourists and locals. So how would you def differentiate in a restaurant between tourists and locals? Or would we focus only on hotels? So it's just definitely something I'd have to know more about before I said yes or no firmly. As far as creative uses of the MRDT, I think uh, Mayor and Council have been very successful in finding some of those new avenues. And something interesting I learned is that while it can't be used for operating costs, it can be used to create new structure which is why we see so many benches and things and flower boxes. So we can't use it to fix a sidewalk, but we could build it to use a new sidewalk, or use it, you know what I mean. So I think also being creative with how we're asking to use that funding, we can get a lot more done if we think about it. And I, yeah, definitely something I'd have to learn a little bit more about though. Okay, thanks, Ali. Duncan, can you answer that question? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jack, for quoting me, because I was the one that actually said uh, I don't see the province allowing Tofino to implement a sales tax. Um, anything the province does takes at least five years and probably longer. I don't see them singling out Tofino. Maybe they'd uh, do the resort communities, or it would have to be province wide. So I still think the better strategy is to use the MRDT. Um, like Jack, I was involved in those discussions and Jack doesn't seem to understand that we were under time crunch and if we push for what I would like to see myself as a percentage, the accommodation providers would not have signed off on it. So was it a great deal? No, but it was some sort of a deal. So now I think we've got to push to get this percentage. But I'll warn you, once you get a percentage, it's great when times are good, but if times aren't so good, you might not be getting so much money. Uh, I'd like to see the MRTT um, expanded from the accommodation providers to other um, commercial transactions, whether it's stores, charter operations, restaurants in the tourist industry. And I think to help in this effort, I think we need to demonstrate to the province just how much money Tofino is contributing to the province's coffers, and that will help in our argument. Great. And Kat? Um, I am not in support of adding a 1% tax across the board on things. I think, um, as other people have stated, it would also negatively impact all of our residents. We already face problems with affordability and we definitely want to eat at our restaurants and buy retail purchases in town and we don't need any more deterrents that are just going to send us down the road to Port Alberni to do things like that. Um, I would be more than happy to sit and negotiate on what to spend the MRDT on. I love negotiating on things and I would look forward to that. I think we have to be really careful as well about nickel and diming the people who are coming to visit us. We can increase costs a little more palatable sometimes to increase the cost of the services by a couple of dollars and then incorporate that money in a different way rather than having this consistent breakdown of little percentages here and there. Great, Tom. 
Thank you. Um, the, uh, the successful negotiation of the $400,000 a year for MRD2 over the next four years for debt servicing our wastewater treatment plant, I think is, is a real success. Uh, the significance of that is that the Ministry of Finance is the one who sets taxation policy. They are the ones that tell us what we can and cannot do. We don't have that ability at the municipal level. So this was a real um, uh, successful negotiation uh, from the District of Tofino with the Ministry of Finance to be able to allow that portion of the MRDT to be successfully used to debt service our infrastructure. So I see this as a huge win. The MRDT, and I think there's a little bit of confusion about the MRDT and the RMI um, in terms of what those expenditures could be used for. So uh, I won't go into it there for lack of time. Um, just to say that uh, recently, um, the understanding that the unique needs of tourism-based economies such as ourselves and the other 14 resort municipalities uh, out there, it was understood that the infrastructure needs of towns such as ourselves that support a tourism economy um, has special needs. We, in our, in our particular case, we have a population of 2,500 and we often support the infrastructure needs of up to 9,000 people. So we, we, as a collaborative approach, it was understood that the best way to approach this is as the unique uh, communities that are part of that RMI is to collaboratively work together to lobby the provincial government to look at forms of alternative revenues for us to be able to support that. It may be a taxation, it may be other forms of support, um, but it is understood through, uh, the province does fully understand that we have unique structural needs and that there has to be alternative ways for us to finance it other than property taxation. Thank you, everyone, for answering that great question. And anything else at the moment from the floor? I do have a couple of submitted questions, so I'm going to go with one of those. Uh, I hear a lot of opposition to developing DL114. Given that we are facing a housing crisis in our community, and given that it's taken decades to get the few affordable units we now have, what are the alternatives to developing DL114 that can be completed in the same amount of time or less? So we're going to draw for this one. And Kat, you are the lucky one to start. I will have to be completely honest and say I do not have alternatives to District Lot 114. I have not been part of the planning process or the research on what land is available. Um, it's something that I look forward to. I am also not opposed to the development of District Lot 114 because as we know, shovels are in the ground, it is happening, and there is the very real possibility that we will be housing people in the next year or two. And I think that is a very positive thing. Thank you, John. Yes, thank you. Um, that would require a little bit of deep study to really do that, but I have hope that there would be uh, an area near the sewer treatment plant that uh, we're going to develop anyway. We have to put a road in there, we have to put infrastructure in there. Why not have another development out there? And that's not a touristy place. Um, it, it, the Talkman Park, it's a touristy place, and I can just see, you know, the people sneaking in their uh, B&Bs and, and uh, Airbnbs and whatnot in that area. So I, I, I would love to see that. And, and uh, how to do it faster and uh, more cost efficient? Well, I, I really think, you know, um, the THC is trying to do what they're doing, but, but it takes a long time, and it costs a lot of money the way it's been done. And, and uh, I don't want to be too critical about that, but I, I somehow feel that if the private sector were to step up, the trouble is they would need clear guidance, they would need uh, clear rules uh, uh, that this isn't going to be used just for, to make money. It's going to have to be a, a low income or a, affordable. Uh, type of situation. So there are ways of doing that and it has been done and, and I think that uh, it's a possibility uh, and that would have to be worked on more. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Al, can you answer that one? Happy to repeat it if you need to repeat it. You said that one, Al. Al, yes, correct. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we, we have looked at other district properties um, including maybe some future use of the downtown where the municipal hall is um, as a housing project. Maybe over in a, over top of some other municipal facilities or library and some combination there. We really don't have that many alternatives 
outside of uh, District Law 114 and that, that are owned by the district. We're everywhere that we own property is probably got a park designation on it. Um, I mean, there's district property at, uh, out on Main Road and to, to put a high density there, we're looking at an area that's in a tsunami zone, so it's not great a great option. There's, um, you know, a number of other park designations, which I don't think we want to turn into affordable housing either. Um, so outside of, of purchasing property, we don't have a lot of options. Um, I mean, there's a potential maybe for some uh, amenity contribution through a future rezoning that we might acquire property but uh, the district is really limited. District Lot 114 has a long history of being used for community advancement. We, Tonquin Apartments was developed on district land. Uh, Mount Colnet Senior Housing was developed on district land. Uh, Peterson Drive, Lane Way, uh, probably underutilized in, in that it could have been higher density, but that was district land as well. So. I, th I think with some com community engagement and involvement, there might be ways of finding parts of, of District Lot 1 Farm that are more suitable for housing and parts that can yet to be preserved. Um, and after that, I'd like to open it up. Does anyone else want to answer that question? Okay. Please. Yeah, there's uh, not a lot of alternatives to deal with what 114 is. We've identified a numerous small pockets of land we're going to take a look at, uh, but nothing that will lead to a, a large development. And I know some people here have scoffed at some of the pockets of land that have been identified and said we well, can't possibly build there. And that's why I've said we are in a stage where we're going to be in a pause because we'll get these 70 units built at DL114 that is going to have an effect on the housing market in Tofino. We are probably not likely to qualify on the next round of housing grants from the feds and the province. I think we've got our fair share, we're probably punching up about weight. But that, that is going to give us a chance to look at these pockets of land, see if they can be built on, see what kind of built in buildings we can put on them, and then when the next other round of grants that we do stand a chance, we may be able to do something. Um, it's tough, and I don't see any private developers stepping forward to uh, build affordable housing. I'm not seeing it anywhere. Anywhere, they want to maximise the return. Um, amenities, it's very unusual for a developer to offer more than 10% as affordable housing. So if he builds 10 units, you might get one designated as affordable. We're going to need more than that. This housing problem is going to continue to grow. The senior population is expected to be 20% uh, of Tofino by 2026. Those people need a place that's smaller so they can downsize and free up accommodation for the younger people. So it's a tough battle. I wish I knew all the answers. It's a big problem and the more you dig into it, the more complicated it gets. Thank you. Thanks, and Tom's going to answer that, and then afterwards we'll take a comment from the from the audience. Great, um, thank you. Um, I just uh, council has just recently passed a resolution on September 27th. I mentioned earlier to look at those options that are possible on private and district-owned land. It is understood that there are limited options, but let's look at those options to begin with. Um, I also did want to point out that we're also looking at a regional housing strategy, not just with Tofino, but with ACRD, with our First Nation neighbours and, and the District of Yucluin. Um, this, uh, this issue of housing is not just specific to Tofino, as I'm sure everyone is aware of. All of us are struggling with this question, and I think from a regional perspective, I think we can have some answers there as well. Whether that will translate into housing, uh, that is left to be seen. I do want to point out though, um, there's been a lot of talk of private development and that uh, the District of Tofino has not done much to, to further that. Uh, as it stands right now, there are over 200 plus units of private development units on the, on, on the books right now, not to be built. These are just permission to proceed or have gone to first reading. These are up to the developers now. We've given them the green light 
to take a look at their plans and to see what possibilities do exist. Within that context, there is, uh, Duncan had pointed out, there are small possibilities for us to be asking for those uh, affordable units within there, and it is correct, they usually don't give more than about 10%, but it is still another option that we have to keep building on all of the opportunities that are available to us in that area. And to, find, uh, to finish off, I do want to talk about the fact that we, we are talking about creating housing, creating housing, and around growth management, I, I want to be very clear that the more housing, the more people that we put into the community, there are services that have to go along with that, such as our housing, such as our schools, such as our water supply. These can't all be looked at in isolation. Housing is one component of this much larger picture, and we continue to just focus on that one aspect. I think we're going to be in trouble later on. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Dr. Zitt, did you want to make a question or comment? I, I didn't know I was going to make a comment. Well, let's get the questions. How about <laughs> I'll make a question. And I'm not sure, I just have to read my rating, which is the hard part. Uh, this is to, uh, I'll, it could be to anybody, but do you think that the ongoing pursuit and provision of bulk housing initiatives by the THC that are subsidized by the citizens of Tofino will have an impact or could have an impact on the provision of housing, even lower cost housing, maybe not affordable, but lower cost, do you think it'll have an impact on private developers? And maybe uh, Ali, Kat, and John could have a go at that. Great, thanks. Um, that is, I'm, I'm gonna hope that I understood the question correctly. Um, just give me a nod if it's right. So do you think that with the THC looking to pursue further housing projects, you're wondering if it will impact the demands we might make on private developers to also provide lower or affordable housing? Uh, maybe I could rephrase. Maybe I could rephrase it to say that would the uh, the ongoing provision of subsidized housing impact private developers' ability or willingness? to develop in this community. Tom's pointed out there's 200 people on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. If we keep giving subsidized um, opportunities through the THC in a bulk fashion, mm -hmm. are, we gonna, are, are those people gonna say, forget it, I'm not developing here? Do you think that, do, uh, so that's a bit of a leading question now, yeah. uh, but no. uh, do you think, do you think, uh, you know, do you think they, that could have an impact on the provision of housing by private developers in this community? I think that it is something I would have to learn so much more about. I would definitely have to look at reports in other communities that have pursued the same path and seen what the effects were there. I do think that as important as housing it is, if we see where this initial phase of DL114 gets us, as Duncan pointed out, it takes a long time to do things. However, I would proceed more with the route of caution where we build what we've started, we find out how many people it's housing, how many needs it's filled, do we still have water left after we do that, and then we go from there, even though it may take so much longer to figure that out, um, it's better than clearing land, saying we're going to build four more apartment buildings and then realizing we don't have the money for it or the water for it and there's also no one left who's looking for affordable housing. So I'm sorry if that's not quite the answer you're looking for, but it's the best I can do for that question. Okay, Kat, you're going to be next for that one. I do not see any scenario where a private developer would be deterred because we are providing affordable housing. I think um, in the most ideal terms, we would expect that private developers would see that the affordable need is being met. Um, and if they feel it's being met, then maybe they feel they can ask whatever price they think is fair or whatever price they desire. Um, but we would hope that they would see that the market says, oh, this is a lower cost. This is what the market is willing to pay and provide that. Um, I don't think we're going to hit a point where we have nobody left to be housed. I don't think any community in the country is going to hit that point. Housing is a thing that we see across the board. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think private developers would be shared at all. Thank you, and John? Thank you, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, like you say, it's a little bit loaded. Um, I b do believe, though, that it might be a good idea uh, if uh, this, if, if the THC does uh, end up having such an impact on the market, um, maybe that's a, not such a bad thing. Uh, for example, like because we don't have much water and because I, I think we should have like a tourism cap, uh, maybe uh, it would be better if we don't keep building and building and building and building and building here, you know. Um, it, it might not be popular with some people, but I, I think it, it might be an option. So, as far as the, uh, the other side of the impact could be, and, and I've thought about this, is, is yeah, they, they might say, oh, hey, you look, they've got their low-cost housing, let's go for really high-cost housing, because that's where people really get the money, and that's where they're really aiming at. Um, if you're a private developer, shoot, yeah, you want to you wanna have multi-million dollar homes, not just a half-million dollar home. Thanks. Okay, give anyone else on the panel a chance to answer that question as well if they like. Okay. We've got one minute. Okay. Uh, I think anywhere in the world that is near a coast is attractive to private developers. Everybody wants to live by the seaside or the beach. Maybe not so much uh, on the east coast at the moment. <laughs> but they'll get rebuilt. Same as Florida is going to get rebuilt in just the same place. Um, but we talk about the 70 units at DO114. There's restrictions on what that housing is going to be for. I mean, 30% of those buildings are going to be for basic people on social assistance. So it's not just going to be 70 units thrown out to the general population. So it's going to impact the market, but it's not going to deter development at all. If we really want affordable housing, a community discussion has got to be about densification. Are we prepared to build up? And if you want to lower greenhouse gases and lower your carbon footprint, that is a solution. And that is a, a discussion for the community because I, I don't want to lead it myself. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Um, we do have one other question that I uh, wanted to get to you, and is there anything else on the floor at the moment? No? Okay. Given that another bear had to be shot recently, how would you push for ensuring restaurant dumpsters are secured properly at all times? Is there anyone who wants to answer that off the top, or will we draw your name out of the box? Allie. Um, I can't speak for all restaurants, but I can speak for the four restaurants who I share a dumpster with. And I was there that morning that the bear was really rampaging. And our dumpsters were locked tight. Our oil dumps were shut. Our recycling had been picked up. And the bear was there and he did not want to leave the parking lot. And it was awful because all of us there were chasing around, we're banging pots, we're hitting the dumpsters with shovels, we're setting off car alarms. Flo had like a spray bottle or something and was trying to chase him. No one, that bear did not get garbage from us that morning, but we still knew he was going to be in trouble. So, I'm not saying it's not the restaurant's fault, but I'm saying that it might not be just the restaurant's fault. And I think as a community, we need to look at every aspect of how we take care of all of our trash and be very aware that we have built our town out into a wildlife corridor. They are here. We can't just lock up our garbage and there will never be another bear in anyone's yard. I think we have to all be very aware of what we do and the fact that wildlife will be and should always be present in this town. Anyone else would like to make a comment there? Uh, if not, we're gonna we're at that time where we're just we're gonna move into your closing statements. Um, 
And I think we're going to go in reverse order this time, so I will start with you. Um, I'm going to finish with the end of my opening statement. Of course, that's kind of my closing statement anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that what we've... Um, Go, okay, let's start again. Uh, looking back at the election in 2018, uh, many of the issues that, that we had then are, are still before us now. We've made some progress on, on some areas, and certainly the, the approvals we got for the housing, affordable housing projects have been great, and the fact that we, we finally uh, began the construction of the liquid waste management plant. Uh, big wins and the culmination of more than one, one term of council work. Um, all that during a, a, a time of, of facing a pandemic and and uh, some, some new members of council joining us and a new mayor. Um, uh, so council was, was pretty good at, at, at staying on track and making progress. Um, but at the 2018 election, we, none of us knew what, what lie before us, and I think we're sort of at a, the same kind of uncertain future right now, just knowing the, the world situation, interest rates, how that's affecting construction, housing prices, and, and just the kinds of moves that we can make, and the things that we've become used to um, seeing from, from in terms of grants from levels of government. It's going to be a much more challenging term. And I think uh, as we go into it, we have to be a very focused council, and uh, that, that's that's my 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 hope is that council stay very focused, uh, build a great strategic plan with not too many things on it, stick to it, and uh, then we can advance uh, to a better future for Tavino, and that's the best way to get things done. So I'm ready to lend my time and experience towards our community goals. Thank you, Al. And work towards a healthy and prosperous future. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'd like to hear from John Ennis. All right, thank you. Um, I cherish this opportunity to speak and, and also to hopefully serve for the community. And uh, I love this place. Um, I love the people here. And I'm hoping that uh, we can face the next few years uh, and succeed in, in surviving and, and turning the tide, as the way I see it, for the ordinary people that live here. Uh, or else we're just going to become another Venice with uh, no real local people living here anymore. No one will be able to afford it except the ultra-rich. We really need to protect the people that have sent, spent their lives, raised their children here, and, 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 and have com contributed to the community all, for all their life. And, and, and for many years, some of them, not all their life, I haven't done all my life. But anyway, um, I, I just wanted to say that and uh, also that, uh, you know, um, let's see, yeah. Well, we, ho housing is one of the, the big things, but we have to be careful not to mix up um, like staff housing and uh, vacation rentals or vacation rentals in, in a private home and vacation rentals that are actually hotels and things like that. We, we need to, uh, be able to be very clear on some of these things and, and uh, be able to differentiate. We need we don't need the bylaw coming and, and, and kicking people out of uh, out of decent clean uh, homes where they are living and that happens to be a trailer or an RV. But we we do need uh, people who are using vacation rentals uh, to be held to account and and, uh, and limit that. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, we will now move on to Duncan, please. Well, I'm sorry, but you can't put any gloss on a $16 million debt, which is what we've accumulated with the liquid waste management plan. That is going to be an anchor around us for at least the next foot council term. So we've got to look at every project, make sure it's financially viable and cost it efficiently. Uh, water is a looming crisis. Um, conservation efforts, will get us to 2035 and then we could be in trouble. 
and solving that is going to take a lot of time when you consider how long it took to get the liquid waste management plant. It's so that planning's got to start now because we can't pay for that. We've got to get funding from the feds and the province. Kennedy Lake is a silver bullet, but I hate to think how much that is going to cost. And to conclude, I just want to conclude with a quick PowerPoint presentation, if you like. Um, this is really primitive. I worked on this all afternoon. This is my PowerPoint presentation. A little bit of maths. It's, uh, I was brought up on this. It's K for knowledge times S, K for skill, times action equals success. I know I and the rest of you in this room, we have the knowledge, we have the skill. Where Tofino has often been lacking in the past is action. So I want to see action. It doesn't have to be big, it can be small, but it can't be zero. We know knowledge and skill isn't going to be zero, so let's do something. And any progress is better than no progress at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Duncan. Uh, we will next hear from Ali. All right, well, perfect timing. I think my stage fright wore off. Nice. Um, thanks to the chamber for putting this on and Jennings and Mark for setting up the systems. Much appreciated. And I think that if I could leave with a few words tonight, it would be that the greatest skill I could bring to council is being a good listener to the different types of people that live here, being friends with them, knowing them, representing the business owners, the people who just moved here who are maybe illegally living in their vans, the people who've been here 10 years or 20 who were loggers or who fought for War of the Woods. And what I want to do is be a bridge between those people and the decisions that council makes so that if someone's unhappy with something and from what everyone warns me about is they will find you in the co-op and yell at you about it. <laughs> um, I want to be able to give them an answer if I made a decision that they don't agree with because about six years ago I found someone who was on council walking in the park and I said, hey, I heard this thing happen. Why did it happen? We all told you we didn't want that. And he said, well, unfortunately, you guys are just collateral damage. So I don't think he probably realized the impacts that would have on a younger me. But if I'm making decisions, I hope they're the right ones that people agree with. And if they don't, I do want to be responsible to them and give them good answers. Thanks. Thank you, Ali. Uh, we would next like to hear the closing statements from Sarah. Well, not quite like Ali. I still have stage fright. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming. And it, I would just say it was a great experience for me to like prepare myself for this. I wish I had prepared myself better for the questions you guys sprung upon me because I don't feel like I've responded quite well enough. Um, for me, I got to touch base with a lot of our community in this process, and that was really important to me. And through that process, I, it made me decide within myself even stronger that I want this, because I want to be the, the connection between the community and what happens. And I'm new to politics, so I don't know all the answers or the procedures, but I really intend to put my heart into this and learn. And um, yeah, so. It's my birthday, so I'm really going to go eat my cake now. <laughs> Happy birthday. Um, let us go to Tom now, please. <laughs> Thank you. Happy birthday, sir. Um, this has been a unique council term. Um, we had the death of a councillor early on, in, in our, and happened to be a close personal friend as well. We've had two by-elections, and we've had to navigate a pandemic. Um, to say the least, it has been a challenge. Um, we have had successes within there, and, and I do want to point that out, even through those challenging times, there has been some hard work done and some successes that have been made. Um, there is not to say that there is not a lot of challenges left in front of us. So I feel my experience on council um, in the last year has provided me with some of that skill set to help move those challenges 
um, in a positive way and to have a skill set that can help make those decisions uh, for the community. I think also with the, the deep uh, regional connections that I've been able to uh, make over the last few decades um, will help in that because I believe a lot of the solutions will be collaborative solutions um, that will help us uh, to address some of these much larger issues that uh, many of our communities face. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tom. And we will wrap up with Kat. This is very exciting. I got to open and close. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. And for those of us, or those of you who are watching over Facebook, I think it's really important to have engagement from the community. Um, municipal, on the municipal level, I feel like we have the greatest ability to affect people's lives on the day-to-day, -day, the ordinary stuff like the sidewalks and the transportation and accessibility to some of our most basic needs. Um, we are seeing very clearly that all of the issues are intertwined. You are coming forward with singular issues, which is amazing because that's where the focus is, but it's obviously going to be our role to look at the bigger picture within those. We want to solve that issue, but also make sure we're balancing the needs of you know, the trees and the water supply and whether the sewage treatment is up and running, et cetera. Um, we also have the unique role of trying to balance the emotional impact that it's going to have along with all the financial responsibility, because we all know the answer is if we had unlimited dollars, we would have zero issues whatsoever. Um, but I would like to close today by saying thank you to Al, Duncan, Tom, Ali, John, and happy birthday, Sarah. And thank you for also putting your names out and making it so that we got to have a proper election and engage in this way with the community. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thanks so much to everyone on the panel and also in the audience watching at home as well. Um, I just wanted to remind you, advanced voting polls open tomorrow at 8 a.m. And Nikki would uh, like to remind you that the voting is not here at the community hall. It is in the council chambers at the district, at the municipal hall. Uh, regular voting day is October 15th, same time, same place. And please come out and vote. That's the most important part of this process. Um, thanks for, again for attending. And as you leave, if you wouldn't mind folding up a couple chairs, we've got a little um, dolly over there to put them on. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good day.